WNYC Studios. As we record this, Democrats in the Senate are preparing to filibuster the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Neil Gorsuch, and not just because they're concerned about his judicial record. House Minority Leader Chuck Schumer explains. Both sides, I know, are pointing fingers at the other in this debate, saying the other side started it. We did not get our nominee when Senator McConnell broke 230 years of Senate precedent and didn't even allow Judge Garland a hearing and a vote. For their part, Republicans are vowing to confirm him by the end of the week, even if this means Senate rules have to change to get rid of the filibuster, the so-called nuclear option. It's just another reminder that the way things used to work was better. Certainly, that's what critics across the spectrum, no matter where they point their fingers, seem to say. But better when? Slate's Dahlia Lithwick is a frequent guest on this show and host of her own excellent podcast about the law, Amicus. This week, she took a closer look at the congressional vetting of Supreme Court nominees to learn more about how this exercise used to go. And now we offer it to you. Last week's confirmation hearing for Neil Gorsuch was, in addition to being a spectacular piece of political theater, also kind of an exercise in nostalgia for confirmations past. At many times in the hearings, various senators and then the nominee himself were waxing poetic about some golden era of confirmation hearings where nominees held forth on substantive doctrine and also civil hearing lasted just a matter of minutes. Here is Senate Democrat Patrick. Patrick Leahy longing for the bygone years when nominees actually answered the questions before them. You have been very hesitant to even talk about a very Supreme Court precedents. I know that Chief Justice Roberts, when he was before us, he said he agreed with Griswold and Brown. Justice Alito said he agreed with Hamdi and Eisenstadt. And just by way of contrast, here is Judge Neil Gorsuch paradoxically longing for the opposite thing, the good old days of the Byron White hearing, where no substantive questions were asked and everybody was polite and respectful. Senator, there's a lot about the confirmation process today that I regret. (laughs) A lot. Yeah. A lot. When Byron White sat here, it was 90 minutes. He was through this body in two weeks and he smoked cigarettes while he gave his testimony. There's a great deal about this process, I regret. So which of these two stories is true? Or are they both just ridiculously rose-colored in retrospect? On today's show, we wanted to talk about the history of confirmation hearings to try to get a sense of whether these events have really gotten worse, have really gotten more shallow, or have really gotten more political and ugly, or if they've always been some variation of substanceless and mean. To help us understand all this is Professor Lori Ringhand. She teaches at the University of Georgia Law School, and her 2013 book, Supreme Court Confirmation Hearings and Constitutional Change, she co-authored with Paul M. Collins, is pretty much the Bible of confirmation hearings past. So, Lori, welcome to Amicus. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. One of the things we heard so much about last week is how confirmation hearings didn't even happen for a long time. But then when they started, they were so brief and clubby and perfunctory, and they were lovely and friendly. When did the modern four-day reality punch and Judy big ticket hearing really start in your view? Or is there not? You can't carbon date it like that. Well, the the practice of the nominee um, him or herself coming before the Senate Judiciary Committee and taking unrestricted questions in an open format. That really only began with um, Felix Frankfurter in 1939 and became cemented as part of the, the process in the 1950s. So that, is, that practice is about 70 years old. But the first confirmation hearing in some form form was in 1916, right? That was for uh, Woodrow Wilson's tap of Louis Brandeis. Mm -hmm. And he didn't show Mm -hmm. up, right? No, they they, they had, um, there there had been 
hearings prior to Felix Frankfurter's. Um, some of them were open to the public, some of them were not. Um, but before Frankfurter, no nominee had testified except with a couple of occasions where nominees had come to answer very specific questions. Um, and so they, they were contained in their scope. Senators wanted to ask about a particular, um, like the Teapot Dome scandal with one of our nominees. They had very precise cabined questioning. Um, so the process has changed in that way. Um, it's also changed. It's, it's hard to think about whether the process is better or worse or more nasty or different because it, it's, it's always been episodically nasty, but the way that has manifested itself in terms of what the public sees has changed a lot over time. So when you look at, if, if you're measuring um, what the process used to be by clubbiness. It, it certainly used to be clubby. You know, the Senate was, was what it was. It was very much a closed club of gentlemen performing functions largely behind closed doors. Um, and that's obviously changed, and the process has changed a lot with a lot along with that. Um, but just because the Senate was operating out of the public eye um, in the first hundred years of our history of Supreme Court confirmation hearings doesn't mean that it always ran smoothly. If you measure success by statistics, there were actually a higher percentage of nominees rejected by the Senate in our first hundred years than there have been in the hundred years since. And they were rejected for partisan political reasons. You know, George Washington had one of his nominees rejected by the Senate. So it's not new for senators to care about who sits on the court and to recognize that politics and partisanship are tools that are going to come. So what's new, Lori, if I'm hearing you right, is the performance of caring, like the spectacle of, you know, having to, to <laughs> well, emote? I, 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 I would push back against a, a bit against the word performance um, because I don't think this is a pointless exercise. Um, and po what has changed is it's become a more public process. And that's changed, I think, for some really good reasons. Um, when you look at what's happened um, in our country and in terms of political accountability and membership in the political community, that's changed a lot since the 1930s. You know, we've gone through, we have direct election of senators. That didn't used to be the case. We have the enfranchisement of women. We've had the um, finally affecting the right to vote and be enfranchised of African Americans in the South. That's growing the populations that senators appropriately need to consider themselves democratically accountable to. So, of course, that greater democratization of the American population has impacted this process just like it's impacted everything else. You can't just make your deals in back rooms anymore and expect that as long as, you know, the three or four hundred people back in your Senate district who basically drive your election process are okay, then everything's going to be great. Um, we have opened up politics in ways that are good and that have affected this process just like they've affected everything else. So then let me try to develop here, I'm going to pull on the string of something you're saying, which is first confirmation, Louis Brandeis, Jewish, and we want to talk about the clients he's represented. Mm -hmm. Other turning point, Felix Frankfurter, Jewish, again, mm -hmm. want to talk about the clients he's represented. Mm -hmm. uh, Thurgood Marshall, right, 1967, also, I think, an outsider. And I want to, mm -hmm. let's just play for a minute. We've got some amazing audio of uh, LBJ talking to his attorney general, Ramsey Clark, in 1967, about whether we can nominate this civil rights icon who is clearly not a member of the club. Let's have a Listen. Where did all this wave of stuff go around that he had this pointing his solicitor general? He's lazy and shiftless and didn't spend much time and doing his homework. Well, I think it's uh, that's some candidates that didn't want him or something. Combination of, uh, of opposition plus uh, it's mostly he fit the mold. He's not a Yale man and that kind of stuff, you know. Just a big easy going, uh, very humane type person. 
So there we have it, Lori. We're hearing uh, LBJ say, where did these ideas that he's shiftless and lazy come from? And Ramsey Clark answering, well, you know, he's not a Yale man. He's just <laughs> le- easygoing. So I don't, I'm not even going to ask you to touch what that was about, but I want you to <laughs> maybe speculate on whether there is this burgeoning theme here, which is, yeah, it's polite and clubby until somebody who's not a member of the club is in the hot seat, and then the hearings get ugly. And let's be really clear, uh, the Thurgood Marshall exchanges with Strom Thurmond during his own confirmation hearing were a low watermark for ugly, right? Right. The Marshall hearings were were just appalling. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have audio of them. But when you read the transcripts, the hostility and sarcasm of many of the questioning senators, it just drips off the page. Um, They are clearly developing themes, trying to establish that he's unqualified, ignorant, um, will just be the, the tool of William Brennan. Um, and it's, it's really a, a disgrace to the U.S. Senate what they attempted to do uh, to Justice Marshall in those hearings. Um, and it's, it's interesting, your point about outsiders, because as I mentioned earlier, Felix Frankfurter was the first nominee um, to take open, unrestricted questions from the Senate Judiciary Committee in a completely public forum. Um, and his uh, confirmation hearing was quite a show because it featured this string of um, very angry public witnesses who were very overt and perfectly happy to say on the record in the Senate hearing room that their opposition to Felix Frankfurter's appointment was because he was Jewish. Um, And there was no subtlety to this. Um, Felix Frankfurter came to the United States as an immigrant. He was only eight years old. He didn't speak English. Uh, And the theme that these public witnesses were hitting over and over and over again is he is not one of us. We can't trust him. He doesn't understand American values. And it was it was really rough. Uh, And the president's counselors told Frankfurter eventually, they said, you need to come and testify. You need to stand up and basically proclaim yourself a proud American, Uh, which is exactly what he did. And then, of course, he went through, he went through on a voice vote, which was much more common. um, And the voice voting practice can mask some of the um, contestedness of these early hearings. But it was it was right out there. There was there was no subtlety about what was going on in that hearing. And, Lori, that was in 1939, correct? Uh, Frankfurt was in 1939. Uh, so, so, Lori, one of the reasons that uh, the standards change for Felix Frankfurter, if I'm not mistaken, is actually because of the catastrophe that was the Hugo Black uh, speedy confirmation and forgetting to ask about little things like his KKK membership. Can you talk for a minute about that? <laughs> The Hugo Black story is fascinating, and it's part of why we had open hearings um, on Justice Frankfurter. Uh, Hugo Black, when he was nominated to the court, was a sitting senator. So he was put through the Senate process really quickly. I think it was five days from the time he was nominated to the time he was fully appointed. Um, And that's obviously extraordinarily fast. And what came out shortly after his confirmation was finalized was that he had accepted in his younger days a membership in the Klan and apparently had never revoked that. And when this broke, it was huge news. People were outraged. The senators were scrambling to try to explain why they hadn't had a hearing process or any sort of public forum to explore that issue and to explain to their voters why they were confirming this person with this history. And the senators at the time, the Senate Judiciary Committee chair, vowed at the time that they wouldn't do that again, that for the next nomination, they would open up the process. And that's part of why in 1939, when Felix Frankfurter was named to the court, we had this open hearing process where Public members came and testified, senators asked questions, and Felix Frankfurter himself testified under oath in public and took unrestricted questions from the senator. And, Lori, am I right that that's also why we have this rather extraordinary moment in 1937 where we actually have a radio address from Hugo Black in which he says uh, in the first iteration of What's in My Heart, America, uh, that he's not a super racist KKK guy after all? Yeah, it's a remarkable audio. Let's have a listen. 
I did join the Klan. I later resigned. I never rejoined. I completely discontinued any association with the organization. I have never resumed it and never expect to do so. At no meeting of any organization, social, political, or fraternal, have I ever indicated the slightest departure from my steadfast faith in the unfettered right of every American to follow his conscience in matters of religion. I number among my friends many members of the colored race. I have watched the progress of its members with sympathy and admiration. So, so Laurie, let's talk about what happens. What, what does this mean when, when someone starts to say, well, okay, now I guess I have to explain to you that I'm really not a racist. Um, in terms of d- evaluating what's in your heart, it's such a, it's such an interesting way to approach that question. Um, what was interesting to me, in part, was he talks about how, of course, people have a right to question this. Um, he's not questioning, in other words, he's not pushing back against the idea that people should and do care about this. Um, and that's in part because we do understand and in some ways have always understood what Supreme Court justices do. Supreme Court justices decide constitutional cases in which there simply aren't crisp, clear, constitutionally correct answers. They simply have to exercise some discretion. And different theories of interpretation call that discretion different things. Originalists like to refer to it as construction rather than interpretation. But they do it, and we've always known that they do it. And part of this process is helping the American people understand how a justice is likely to use that discretion, and perhaps more pertinently, where they're likely to exercise it. One of the things that we see when we look at nominee responsiveness at these hearings is there's kind of become a little bit of a litany about the types, the cases that nominees say, yep, I'm okay with that, and then the ones that they refuse to talk about. And I think it's important that nominees go through that process because what they're doing when they say, yes, that's a great precedent. They all affirm Brown. Everyone says Brown is a wonderful case, as it is, of course. And when they go through that process, what they're signaling is, I consider that settled. It may, maybe it used to be controversial, but I accept the consensus. That's not controversial anymore. We're not going back there. So this is a good time to play Antonin Scalia, maybe, who seems to who seems to not even uh, want to uh, acknowledge that Marbury v. Madison uh, <laughs> is settled. Let, let's have a listen, just to point out kind of what a badass he really was. I believe you testified earlier that um, a decision as old as Marbury v. Madison, 183, which does establish the basic power of the Supreme Court to decide. Uh, The final interpretation of the Constitution is uh, a settled issue as far as you're concerned? I I said, Senator, it's it's a pillar of of, of our system. Uh, I don't want to say that anything is a settled issue as far as I'm concerned. Uh, If somebody wants to come in and challenge Marbury versus Madison, I'll listen to them. But... It is obviously a pillar of our current system. So that's Ar- Arlen Specter and Justice Scalia. Talk a little bit about Scalia's skittishness there, Lori. Yeah. Well, Scalia is definitely an outlier on this. Um, all of his contemporaries were much more willing to affirm the, the kind of American canon of constitutional law cases. So what we see from Scalia there is actually quite extraordinary. And I think the only reason he was actually able to get away with that, if you remember, he was nominated at the same time that um, Justice Rehnquist was being elevated to Chief Justice. And the Democrats at the time made a very strategic decision to aim their fire at the Rehnquist nomination, not the Scalia nomination. I don't think he could have gotten away with what he just did there if his nomination had been more the target of the political fight. So I want to 
uh, talk a little bit about television, because uh, as I understand it, TV is introduced in when? 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor's confirmation hearings? Yep. Justice O'Connor was the first hearing to be tested, to be broadcast on TV. And again, she's the first woman uh, mm-hmm. outsider. Uh, so maybe, again, that explains why deeper scrutiny happens. Um, but also, let's just play O'Connor, uh, just going back to this what's in your heart question, because here she is being questioned by Strom Thurmond uh, on her views about abortion. And, and she's willing to answer about her own personal views. Judge O'Connor, there has been much discussion about your views on the subject of abortion. Would you discuss your philosophy on abortion, both personal and judicial, and explain your actions as a state senator in Arizona on certain specific matters? First, your 1970 committee vote in favor of House Bill 20 which would have re- repealed Arizona's felony statutes on abortion. My own view in the area of abortion is that I am opposed to it as a matter of birth control or otherwise. Um, the subject of abortion is a valid one, in my view, for legislative action uh, subject to any constitutional restraints or limitations. Lori, how stunning is it today to hear O'Connor actually talking about her own personal beliefs and moral values? That's really, really different from what we get now, right? Well, it's interesting because what we see is nominees have a limited ability to run away from their own record. Um, So someone like O'Connor, who had that history, someone like Justice Ginsburg, who also had, prior to her nomination, been fairly forthright about her opinions on these matters, there's not always benefit, as we saw with Judge Bork, to try to pretend that you don't believe things that you've said in public before. That just doesn't work very well for nominees. So there's a little bit of management it, that goes into deciding what you have to own at the hearings and what you can avoid. It's also interesting, just we sometimes forget the history of this. When Justice O'Connor was nominated, the Republican Party, not President Reagan, but the Republican Party was still flirting with, you know, kind of big tentism on abortion. And that hadn't fully gelled as a absolute um, requirement for Republican nominees. Lori, do you want to talk for a minute about uh, the impact that adding television to this mix uh, eventually uh, brings about? I mean, O'Connor really, now it's a reality show, right? See, you're you're so negative on this process. (laughs) I don't think it's that bad. (laughs) So O'Connor's hearing was televised both because um, we we now had the 24-hour news networks and kind of the the interest driven by that. I think it was C-SPAN that that was up and running in time for her hearings. And um, also, of course, though, her nomination was a, a win for President Reagan. He had promised as a candidate to appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. So she was a little bit of a pop star um, for for them in that regard. And I think there was a lot of public interest in her hearing because she was the first woman nominated and, and appointed to the court. And the fact that that public interest was captured in a televised format isn't bad. Again, it increases democratic um, accessibility to the process. And as I said earlier, the process has become more, not less, substantive. Um, senators are asking more questions. They're asking questions about precedent. Nominees, despite kind of our public rhetoric about this, are actually fairly forthcoming. Their level of forthcomingness has not changed over over the years. It's basically the same that it's been since the hearings began. So, so I don't think it's a bad thing that the people see this process. At the very least, they see these hotly contested political issues play out and be talked about in the language of constitutional law. And I think that's really good. I'm totally chastened. I'm not cynical anymore. (laughs) I want to ask you, Lori, uh, about the so-called Ginsburg rule because it got a lot of play again last week. Uh, Let's listen to Ruth Bader Ginsburg at her confirmation hearings famously promising what she would and wouldn't talk about. A judge sworn to decide impartially can offer no forecasts, no hints, 
for that would show not only disregard for the specifics of the particular case, it would display disdain for the entire judicial process. Slowest talker ever. Uh, Lori, <laughs> does yes. Ginsburg follow the Ginsburg rule? Justice Ginsburg here, she, she's a victim of her own ability to turn a phrase um, because she said much more succinctly and memorably what every single nominee sitting on that chair has said. Um, I was rereading the Potter Stewart hearings recently from 1959, um, and they had exactly the same conversation. Interestingly, they were having it about Brown, but there was this long back and forth where the nominee is saying, I'm sorry, it really wouldn't be appropriate for me to answer that question. You shouldn't vote for me conditioned on how you think I'm going to vote in any individual issue issue. The nominee, Potter Stewart, says that I, I can't talk about my personal feelings. The senators have this long back and forth about whether it's even appropriate to ask questions specifically about Brown. None of this is new. Justice Ginsburg just said it better than anybody else, and that's come back to haunt her. So the so-called Ginsburg rule is really, really poorly named. Justice Ginsburg was not less responsive at her hearings than other nominees have been. And again, the trend line on nominee responsiveness really hasn't changed. Lori Ringhan teaches at the University of Georgia Law School. Her 2013 book, Supreme Court Confirmation Hearings and Constitutional Change with Paul M. Collins, is a must-read if you're trying to figure out whether confirmation hearings suck as bad as I think they do. Lori, thank you for joining us on Amicus. Thank you for having me. That was Slate's Amicus podcast, hosted by the always insightful Dahlia Lithwick, available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're interested in the real-life drama of the courts, you definitely should seek it out. Also, a reminder that you can sign up for the On the Media newsletter at our website, onthemedia.org. It comes out every Thursday morning with previews of what we're working on, insights into other media our producers are consuming, and some inspired weirdness. Also, if you subscribe right now, you could win one of the hats that I compulsively crochet. If you're already subscribed, you're already entered to win. We've already given away two. There's one more week and one more hat to give away. I have to concede that unlike the show, these hats are not exactly award-winning, but hell, you still get the newsletter. Newsletter. 